This presentation is made possible by the generous contributors to the Serious Joy Scholarship, permitting our graduates to launch into life and ministry without a burden of student loan debt. It's been several times referred to that I'm going to be preaching this morning. That's not exactly how I would describe this. Um, what I do when I preach, uh, like two mornings ago at Capitol Hill Baptist Church, I preached for uh, 66 minutes, I'm a little sorry to say, on uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 14. Uh, so you can go listen to that on the CatBap website, see what that's like. But what I'm going to do now, I was asked to speak specifically to you, to share some things about the Puritans. And the Puritans have been long friends of mine, and I have found them very helpful and encouraging in ministry and endurance in ministry. And I know that the Puritans these days are not everybody's favorite. Um, uh, Precious Puritans, the song a few years ago, kind of did a, helped a, a sea change in our little corner of evangelicalism and the way the Puritans were viewed. At the time, I was kind of thankful for the song because I, I like things that are more accurate, and there are certainly problems with some of the Puritans. But I fear it's actually left an, a misunderstanding, a bad misunderstanding of the Puritans, which has just continued on in a long a list of uh, sort of the, the mudstorm that Puritanism has existed in its entire history. Uh, the name Puritan was given as an insult. You know, it's like calling somebody overly precise or too punctilious or legalistic. You know, you Puritan. So that's the way the word came. It was not a happy word. Um, and it's the way that they have been represented uh, throughout as sort of killjoys who are nightmarishly self-righteous hypocrites. So if you were assigned Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, now that's the lies Nathaniel Hawthorne spread about the Puritans. Uh, or if you think the Puritans were a great collection of slavery advocates, you know, that's a new thing culturally that people are thinking that. And again, with all due respect, I think it just shows a lot of ignorance. Uh, and it shows some misunderstanding of what do we mean when we say Puritanism. Now, if you're including the fact that some uh, men who have been known and admired in the 1700s actually owned slaves, that is true. Uh, but when we say Puritans, what we mainly mean are the people, the Reformed Christians in England from 1500 to 1700. So if you take the guy Richard Sibbs that I did my work on, uh, Sibbs would not have known anyone who uh, would have thought about uh, trafficking in people. It would not have been legal or common or understood or known among the Puritans of his generation. So that's a, it's just a historical misunderstanding that's grown up and once again been turned into another malicious misrepresentation of them. Uh, Macaulay in his history of England says the Puritan hated bear baiting, not because it gave pain to the bear, but because it gave pleasure to the spectators. Uh, it was H.L. Mencken who said that Puritanism was the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. Um, or one more, the Puritans came to America in the hopes of discovering greater restrictions than were permissible under English law. Well, I could sadly go on all morning entertaining you with misrepresentations of the Puritans, but what I'd rather do is help you understand how I, as a pastor in a local church, have found in the collection of writings of these mainly preachers, uh, but also other Christians from that time, how I've found real help as a pastor uh, for the work the Lord has called me to do. So I want to give you 12, maybe, or just say some, we'll see how the time goes, uh, observations that are sort of overlapping with each other on their lives and ministries that have aided me. And number one, let me just start out right from the gate with Reformed theology. Uh, I was brought up in a sort of regular Southern Baptist church where you would have never heard those two words. Now, looking back, I think what was expounded from the scripture was pretty consistent with God's sovereignty and salvation. But certainly the kind of concentrated truth that we see in the Puritan preachers, uh, in the way they put their Bible together, uh, was not present. And when I began, I think initially, my, my particular pathway was Spurgeon, Bunyan, and then uh, Baxter Owen, and then Sibs, and then uh, on out. Uh, so that, that was the way I kind of got into it all. And when I started reading them, the arguments that I'd been having as a young Christian about Calvinism and Arminianism 
where Calvinists were always portrayed as these dour, killjoy, just all those caricatures I just read you about, the Puritans, they manifestly defeated that. Uh, these were men who had warm affections, supremely for God, but for God's people. And somehow those affections were not despite, but they were because of their understanding of our utter helplessness because of total depravity. And the fact that we stood in need completely of mercy because of unconditional election, that he loved us specially, limited atonement, that he would draw all of his own to himself, irresistible grace, and he would not lose a one. No one would pluck us out of his hand. Perseverance of the saints. Uh, friends, all of those understandings came in wonderful biblical fashion, larded with piety uh, from the Puritan writers to me. So that's number one. Number two, the idea that the church is God's. The church belongs to God. Many places we can see this, of course, in scripture. Uh, I think immediately of Acts 20, when Paul is meeting with the Ephesian elders, and he says in verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. What a striking phrase. He obtained the church with his own blood. Do you think you're making too much of the church? You're thinking the church is too important? You're beginning to sound like maybe some kind of Roman Catholic? No, I think I'm sounding like Paul here in Acts 20. Or like Peter, if you think of Peter over in 1 Peter chapter 5 at the beginning where he says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Sometimes, because they are among us as the shepherds, we, we begin to feel they're ours, but they're not. Mortality will remind us of that very soon, perhaps before that retirement. But this idea that the flock belongs to God, these are his sheep, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, nor dominating over those in your charge, charge, it's a temporary stewardship, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. It's his, he will evaluate our work. Uh, that's contrasted, of course, back in Ezekiel with Ezekiel 37, when if you want to, uh, to see, or sorry, 36, if you want to see the way the Lord talks to those who would abuse his people, you can see how dangerous it is as shepherds for us to do anything, then remember that the church is God's. It belongs to God, not to the minister, not to the leaders of the church, not to the donors, uh, not even to the congregation, said the advocate of congregationalism. The church belongs to God. And therefore, the task that you and I as pastors undertake is a serious task. William Perkins said, or it was said of him that in his sermons, he used to pronounce the word damn with such an emphasis as left a doleful echo in his auditor's ears a good while after. And when he was a catechist at Christ College and expounding the commandments, he applied them so home to the conscience as he was able to make his hearers' hearts fall down and their hairs almost to stand up. You think of the accountability this means that we have in this task. I think in most every talk I give outside of my own pulpit, I quote John Brown in his letter of paternal counsels to one of his pupils newly ordained over a small congregation. He says, I know the vanity of your heart and that you will feel mortified that your congregation is very small in comparison with those of your brethren around you. But assure yourself on the word of an old man that when you come to give an account of them to the Lord Christ at his judgment seat, you will think you have had enough. There's a humility in the task that comes when you realize what the task is, the hugeness of it, the fact that it is all about God. And you will be sustained and helped 
by remembering that and by writings you find that help give you that sense of the presence of God in all of the matters that you'll undertake. And you'll be given a, a sense of privilege of the task. Uh, surely there are times, brother pastor, when you have been involved in one of those very difficult marriage situations. I call them the kind of Mount Everest of the pastoral vocation. When you just feel absolutely befuddled about what you should do, and at the same time, you're aware of the privilege of what the Lord is calling you to do. William Perkins also used to preach to the prisoners. So he was, a, at the time, his reputation as a theologian throughout Europe just rang. And yet he would trudge up the little hill in Cambridge to the old Norman castle, which had become the jail, and he would preach to the prisoners regularly because he knew the privilege that was involved in being a herald of the king to those made in his image. Let me tell you a third thing. It's this combination of theology and worship and pastoral care, all centered in the grace of God. A theology of grace that's worked out in everything from the time together to your own personal devotion to the way you understand you're to care for the sheep that God has called you to shepherd. Grace really becomes an igniting spark and shaping influence in our thanks and praise. And you can tell it in so many ways in the sermons of a preacher. You can tell it in the songs that are selected, in the scriptures that are read. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, you can tell it in the way announcements are made. Is there an understanding that what we're about is fundamentally about the grace of God? That should be a note in our interactions with others in the body. We should know, among other things, that it's God that gives the growth. We have to have a confidence deep in our bones that this is his work. We are utterly dependent on him, and there is no place we would rather be than to be utterly dependent on him. A fourth thing, particularly in pastoral care, I love how the fact that in their evangelism, the Puritans were patient. Uh, Jim Packer has a wonderful um, chapter in his book, Quest for Godliness. Is that what it's called here? In England, it's Among God's Giants. But here in America, it's Quest for Godliness. You can see the national characters, can't you? Among God's Giants and the different pictures of guys in funny hats. And in America, it's his gold lettering, and it's quest for godliness. But anyway, it's the same essays. Um, he has this one chapter on the Puritans as evangelists, which is wonderful. If you've never read it, if, if you think of evangelism as something difficult and painful and quick and whew, it's done, then uh, you're going to burn out as a pastor, and you should probably just find another job now. Uh, the Puritans will help you to see the long game in evangelism, being patient. Uh, the demands of discipleship, uh, caring over time for people, including once they're converted. I mentioned Perkins a minute ago. He, uh, there's an account of him going to speak specifically to a man who was condemned to be hanged. And when he's brought up on the gallows, Perkins asks for the privilege of being able to address him. And the people, both because of his Perkins' reputation, but also the, the seriousness of the moment before the man's death, they, they, they allowed him to step up. He came up on the gallows and he preached to him. And the people watching said that Perkins, by his preaching to him, brought the man to tears, considering his spiritual poverty. And then when that had been done and Perkins continued to preach the gospel, he brought him to tears of joy about what God had provided for him in Christ. Praise the Lord for that kind of pastoral care, even reaching out to someone who's not yet a member of your flock, someone who is evidently lost. But also when we're dealing with our own congregation, and we know the tender consciences there are, and we know that people can sometimes feel that 
They, maybe they read 1 John carelessly and they feel that this means that they must not be a Christian because they sin. Uh, if you're a preacher, you know what I mean. A, a, I don't know, a quarter to a third of your congregation will be people like that. The Puritans are wonderful examples in their preaching of being able to help, this, help the Christian to examine themselves and yet not lose sight of God's grace. That's a wonderful combination. It's a hard thing to do. It, it's, it's very easy to let loose of one side of that just to go into deep self-examination and be self-focused, introspective, and become a kind of legalistic self-salvation person. Or you can become a kind of grace Nazi and any imperative verb is like against grace and you kind of let alone any imperative verbs and it's just all everything, ah, and we can't do it, but Christ did it for us. I mean, if that's every sermon you're preaching, brothers, you're being unfaithful. There are imperative verbs in the Bible that Christians are to obey and that in no way undermines God's grace. Well, if that seems complicated to you, grab a Puritan and start reading. Grab Flavel, grab Watson, grab Book, Brooks or Burroughs, uh, grab Sibs. Uh, go and find one of these brothers who had decades of experience ministering this gospel to hurting souls. You see it particularly in pastoral care in their cases of conscience. Uh, a case of conscience is when you look at a particular question of how the Christian should behave. Uh, and they took pleasing God very seriously. So. The individual questions that would come up in Christians' lives, that's the kind of things you and I deal with every day as members of the church ask us about this or that or the other. If you've never read Richard, or read, if you've never looked at Richard Baxter's book, Christian Directory, it's a gigantic volume when it was published. It's like that tall, that thick, and you open it up and it's double columns of small print, you know, and Baxter goes through almost every imaginable moral qualm you could consider. Now, you won't find questions about the priority of lace making, which he does deal with, uh, in the same way that you will other questions, but his care in dealing with people's souls will be something you can admire and be admonished by. So it'd be worth reading a few pages and then thinking about in your own work with your own church how you could approximate that care. And also that care in Richard Baxter's case was shown in visitation. You know, he modeled visitation by one, by him or by his assistant, where he would try to see each family in his large congregation per year, or they would come and see him. There's a, there's a feeling of pastoral care when you read the Puritans and you read about their lives and ministries that showed that they cared more about how the people were than how many they were. And in that sense, the Puritans are good readers of the Bible. Do you remember the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15? Uh, turn, turn to Acts 15 for a second. Let's just go there for a second. Acts 15. They clarify the gospel in this wonderful salvation historical, in some ways, crux of the, of the post Pentecost, New Testament. And then, you look there, Acts 15. I love Paul's suggestion in verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. How vague is that? Count them. Send us the percentage of increase, particularly in 20 to 44 year olds. How many men? How's the giving? I, I don't know what kind of conversations Paul had about stuff like that. I just know what the Holy Spirit had recorded. And here he had recorded Paul saying to Barnabas, hey, let's go see how they are. What in your pastoral ministry, in the pastoral care you give your congregation represents that concern to see how they are. Sure, if there's been a death in the family, a crisis, somebody's home burns down, there, there's care. But I mean, just in the general sense, how are they? Gotta keep going. Number five, let me tell you a fifth one. One thing I learned from the Puritans is the importance of discipline. Personally, these brother pastors were very disciplined. And they were often disciplined through 
a lot of personal pain. Uh, medical care is still not great in England, I can say, having lived there six and a half years, but it was certainly not great there in the 16th century. So many of these men struggled with sickness. When Richard Greenham would be up during the night sick, which was frequently, uh, his manner was, as much as he possibly could, to spend the time in meditation and prayer. When Perkins, William Perkins, lay dying a painful death, and he heard one friend praying that the Lord would mitigate the pain, take the pain away, Perkins said, pray not for an ease of my torments, but for an increase of my patience. Friends, that's absolutely typical. Perkins was not unusual in that. These men are regularly described as painful in their ministry or their preaching, which doesn't mean in a humorous sense, it inflicts pain on me to sit and have to listen to you, but it means they took pains, they took trouble, in order to preach God's word well, searchingly, powerfully to the people who were committed to them. They spared no pains. Where you and I have a default setting that our culture is financially built to encourage, to love, ease, and pleasure, these men were spiritually suspicious of ease and pleasure. That's not saying ease is wrong, that we need no rest. It's not saying pleasure is wrong, but they were suspicious of the ease and the pleasures of this world and this life. But this importance of discipline in the Puritans I've seen not only in their individual lives, but certainly in their churches. Their whole name Puritan is because they were concerned that the churches be more pure. So in a most technical sense, being most technical here, um, John Owen in his later life is not a Puritan, uh, nor is Jeremiah Burroughs, nor is Richard Baxter. I mean, if you're getting in the late 1600s, the, about the only Puritan would be William Gurnall, who wrote Christian Complete Armor. What do I mean by that? Well, because the word Puritan had reference to purifying, particularly the Church of England. And all those brothers like John Bunyan who went outside the Church of England, they were called nonconformists. The Puritans are Anglicans, it's a subset of Anglicans who were trying, like Richard Sibbs, who were trying to purify the Church of England. But we understand the way Banner of Truth uses the word and we're quite happy with it generally. They understood their fellowship across denominational lines. Uh, they had warm fellowship with each other. They recognized each other as gospel men and so we do. And I think we see in them, and certainly I have been helped by seeing their concern over doctrinal errors in the church and errors of discipleship and unrepentant sin in members. We want to see the churches pure. Now, when, when we undertake this as pastors, we face all kinds of opposition. Uh, we face opposition from the people in the flesh who don't want their sins confronted. Uh, we find opposition from people who think the church should not be as pure as we think it should be, and they call us Donatists and dismiss us with historical misrepresentations. Uh, but the truth is, Christ wants his bride washed with the water of the word. He wants a pure bride, and you and I are called to that work, which includes discipline. A sixth thing, and these next two points really have to do with our public gatherings on the Lord's Day. And I want to point that out specifically because I think evangelical Christianity today, at least the variety we have in America, is not very concerned with the gathering on the Lord's Day. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, Jonathan Gibson and Mark Ernge have edited a couple of years ago a volume called Reformation Worship, where they look at liturgies of the past for the present. And the, the three opening chapters of this book, Reformation Worship, are so good, we have all of our pastoral interns at CHBC read them. We don't even have them read Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. But we have them read these first three chapters in Jonathan Gibson and Mark Erngay's book, Reformation Worship, because there's such wonderful biblical theological presentations of worship, and particularly as it gets to what do you do together when you come. And when that book came out, I 
I forced myself to read the entire thing, every word of every liturgy, scores and scores of liturgies from 1526, 1527, 1528. What are they doing in Wittenberg? What are they doing in Munster? What are they doing? And just read them all. And it was fascinating to watch the Reformation and realize the Reformation was in large measure changing what you did in the Sunday service. That was the Reformation. It's doing that instead of that. That's what makes it all happen. That, in many ways, is it. So just two things particularly that I learned from the Puritans about that supremely important gathering on Sunday morning. First, it'll be no surprise to you, the centrality of preaching, both in the service and in my schedule in order to prepare. So for me, for a morning sermon, like I preached this last Sunday, it'll take me about two full days of preparation. That's just me. You may be more or less. But preaching is central to the ministry that we are called to. And I see that so much in the Puritans. Think of Richard Greenham, a Puritan just outside of Cambridge. His constant course we read was to preach twice on the Lord's Day and before the evening sermon to catechize the young people of the parish. His manner also was to preach on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and on Thursdays to catechize the youth, and again on Fridays to preach to his people, and that on these weekdays the people might have the better opportunity to attend upon his ministry. His course was to be in the pulpit in the morning so soon as he could well see. He was so earnest and took such extraordinary pains in his preaching that his shirt would usually be as wet with sweating as if he'd been drenched in water, so that he was forced as soon as he came out of the pulpit to shift himself. And this wonderful and excessive pain, he took all his time. Friends, preaching was central in their schedules and in their actual services. I was doing a, um, a talk kind of like this one, a set of three talks at All Souls once in London years ago. And I was on this very point and I mentioned uh, that uh, Lawrence Chatterton of, of um, St. Clement's in Cambridge had preached sermons, sometimes two or three hours long. And uh, there were some sounds just like the one whoever over there just made, some sounds like that in the, the group gathered. And I said, hey, have you ever been around in church in East Anglia and you've noticed an old piece of wrought iron coming out from the pulpit, turn up like this and then with a circle on top? A lot of people nodded their heads, you've seen those. Does anybody have any idea what they were? Nobody knew. I said, those were gifts of the congregation to the preacher, usually given sometime in the late 1500s. And it was an hourglass holder. <laughs> and it was to give them one or two turns of the hourglass. And one person gasped out loud, louder than you just did, Jonathan. And, um, just said, what time did that leave for worship? And I just saw the whole Protestant Reformation just kind of crumble. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I gathered myself and became unusually self-possessed. And I said, you have to remember that the people who were hearing those sermons, some of them would have remembered what it was like to see John Rowland burned to death in Hadley, or, sorry, Roland Taylor, or John Rogers, or John Hooper. Some of, them, some of the older ones there would remember the smell of burning flesh that happened to people who were doing nothing more than trying to translate the Bible into a language they could read. So if they could sit and be instructed hearing the Bible in their own language with instruction about it, they realized the huge privilege they were being given, and they wanted that privilege. And they understood hearing and responding to God's word as the center of their Christian worship. A part of it I've learned from them as well is the importance of public prayer, prayers in those services. Many of them prepared their prayers. Some of you will know this collection of Puritan prayers, Valley of Vision. Now, raise your hand if you know this book. Okay, now we're at a Christian conference and it's aimed at pastors and students. So if you've never heard of this book, please stand up. Come on, public honesty right now. Keep standing, more of you need to be honest. Never heard of this book, come on, stand up. I'm not trying to shame you, I'm trying to love you. <laughs> That's fine, I, there was a time when I had not heard of this book. All right, please be seated. I'm telling you, this book is a good investment. 
Um, the brother who put this thing together like 40 years ago, Arthur Bennett, he pulled together prayers written by the Puritans. He modernized them slightly, uh, so they're a little bit easier for us to read. And the way I've used them in my own quiet time, I'll put like a piece of paper over, and I'll just pull down and read one line and meditate on it. Suck on it for a while. Then go down another line. And uh, if we have time, uh, at the end, I'll, I'll share one last prayer with you uh, as the conclusion of this time together. But they took time to prepare their prayers. Many of them prayed at great length. It's odd these days, if you go to a lot of evangelical church services, there, there's no time in prayer. If you want time in prayer, you've got to go to a Roman Catholic church. Evangelical churches often spend very little time in public prayer, and I, I don't understand that. The Puritans will, will help you. They'll, they'll challenge you here. Uh, when the Westminster Assembly was happening, they would meet over for days of prayer and fasting at St. Margaret's Church right next to the Abbey, and they would have their like, an hour or two sermon and then an hour or two of prayer. And it wouldn't be like multiple, it'd be one guy up there praying. And he would have worked to prepare that prayer as carefully as he would have worked to prepare a sermon. So if you come to Capitol Hill Baptist Church, our services are not quite like that, but there will be a five or 10 minute prayer of praise. There will be like a five minute or maybe a little longer prayer of confession. And then there'll be a pastoral prayer, usually by the pastor who's preaching. And when it's me, that prayer's gonna be about five to 10 minutes long. It's gonna be intercession. And I will probably spend about an hour working to prepare that prayer. Uh, and it's a huge privilege. I was telling John uh, Piper the other day at lunch that I almost feel like that would be harder for me to give up than the preaching. Uh, I love preaching God's word to the people, but it is, it is precious to, to take all of them together and turn around to the Lord and speak on behalf of all of them and bring their deeds to him. I just feel like it's a very tender part of being a pastor. And, and God answers those prayers. I mean, I've never been faithful enough to keep like a journal of all answered prayers. I wish I'd done it. I'm thankful for those of you who are that disciplined. You're more like the Puritans than I am at that point. But I, I, in my own testimony, week after week, we see God answer things we pray for, just again and again. He's a faithful God, and every time you and I spend time praying in public, talking to the God so long talk, taking so long talking to him that it bores the people who are there who just pretend to know him. Just go right ahead. The church is not for them. The church is for the bride of Christ. Build up that bride. Help them to, to see the beauty and the glory of Christ. And as their lives change, others will come. But every time you lead in prayer, you're making a, a declaration and a demonstration that you are not sufficient that you need help, and that he is utterly reliable and dependable. Much more I could say about that, but the importance of public prayer, I feel like I've learned that from the Puritans. An eighth thing, the importance of education. Uh, for ministers, uh, when you look back at many of the Puritans whose writings you can read today, you'll find they were educated, uh, particularly at Cambridge. Uh, and they spent time studying uh, Richard Greenham studied very hard, rising every day, both winter and summer, at four o'clock in the morning. If you ever wondered why Puritanism was so wonderful, how did it end? I don't know. Jim Packer suggested that it was because the ministry was cut off from university training after 1662 when you had to conform to the Church of England to continue to be trained in the university. I think today it's very popular in some circles to minimize the importance of education for the ministry. But I think that hurts us. One of the things I appreciate about Bethlehem College and Seminary is the dedication you guys have to the primary languages. Now, thank you for that. You're making a good long-term investment in the church. You're, you're mirroring the commitment of the Puritans in that. If you wanna see that drawn into the missions world, Nine Marks has just published a new book. I don't think it's in your bookstore yet, uh, but I think it's out. I have a copy because I wrote the foreword. But uh, it's a... Uh, Matt Rhodes, No Shortcut to Success, A Manifesto for Modern Missions. And one of the main things Matt does in this, Matt, who is himself uh, a missionary in a sort of closed country, um, he talks about the importance of training. And you can take what you read here and apply it to your own work as a pastor. Don't misunderstand the importance of 
education for you if you would be a minister of God's word. But it's also true for your members. That's why, brothers, you want to preach serious sermons. You don't want to preach light and trifling sermons, no matter how popular. Uh, you want to encourage the, the families and friends there to rehearse them afterwards. I very often in my sermons will say, I'd love to talk more about that, but I don't have any time. Why don't you ask me about that? Or I'll talk about that over lunch. Or sometimes I'll give kids questions to ask their parents at lunch. You know, do things just to bless everybody. <laughs> you can use your small groups in your church to reflect on the sermon, to try to apply it further. Encourage the, the reading of scripture. That's why in the Puritan movement, you'll see they have these afternoon lectures, they're called. That's usually at one o'clock on a Sunday. Uh, there's always catechizing going on. There's regular visitation, like we mentioned from Baxter. Greenham's manner, again, was besides his public preaching and catechizing, he would walk out in the fields to confer with his neighbors as they were at the plow. One of the things I've tried to do with my congregation is to help them get to know books of the Bible. Uh, so when they're thinking about a particular problem, I'm fine with them saying, hey, didn't Tony Reiki or David Mathis just write a cool book on this? That's fine. We sell their books. But I'd also like to know, you know, First Peter's about that. Actually, James is good on that. Actually, Zephaniah has this amazing passage. I want them to know what the burdens of books of the Bible are. If you're feeling persecuted, if you're thinking of, of stopping following Jesus, I'd love you to know to go to Hebrews. You know, I, if you're feeling, you just, just can go on and on through every book of the Bible. So encourage them to outline their books, to get to know the weight and balance of their arguments. Number nine, the Puritans themselves took a personal responsibility in training ministers. Often a Puritan pastor would have a young minister in training live with them in their home. So Richard Greenham that I've mentioned, who was out in Dry Drayton just outside of Cambridge, quote, was a special instrument and means under God to encourage and train up many young godly men in the holy service of Christ in the work of the ministry. That kind of ministry was known by to be had by a number, a John Cotton was seen to be unusually skilled in Boston and Lincolnshire before he came across and brought his congregation, and thus they called that town Boston. But he was in Boston in Lincolnshire in England, and he would take men after they graduated from Cambridge, and he would be the, the sort of salt seller, they called him. When you've got the salt made, then you put it in cotton for a while, cotton will help them learn how to really become a pastor. There would be informal networks of people from schools to colleges to, to ministers to train under persons, and they would find places where they could live and work as ministers in useful pulpits. Basically, what you see going on there among the Puritans is one example of what I think has gone on from the Great Commission till today. The way the Great Commission gets fulfilled is by a church producing more preachers than it uses. Big idea, small words. Puritans are one example. So if you imagine every church in America represented by a red dot or a green dot. Red dot, net deficit. When they need a preacher, they suck in from outside. Green dot, they're preparing more preachers under God's grace, by God's grace. Glory goes to him. They're preparing more preachers than they themselves need. So pastor, does your church, when you have to go on vacation, do they have to call somebody from outside to preach? It's fine to have people from outside preach. But if I were you, I would pray toward, I would, I would do it publicly, I would get your congregation to pray toward the fact that you could see young men raised up to preach so that not only is your own pulpit fill, filled, but when pastors around in smaller congregations need some relief, they know they can just call your church. One of the strangest ministries the Lord has given our church is we have members of our church, not even elders, just like members of our church out preaching in all kinds of churches probably most Sundays of the year. We, we, get, we get calls from local Calvary Chapel, PCA, Bible Church, Acts 29, certainly Southern Baptist churches, when they're gonna be gone saying, hey, I'll call CHBC, they'll send us a preacher. And I, I love that reputation. And I love hearing about the sermons and the way the Lord will bless these. I see that personal responsibility in training ministers as part of how our generation is to be involved in fulfilling the Great Commission. So pastor, you wanna make as one of your main goals, not just the prosperity of your own congregation, but the prosperity of other churches. So if you think what you're called 
to do solely is to see your congregation prosper, I think you're the wrong man to be a pastor. You need to take a minute. See, if, if, if I've been praying for revival, Andy, Andy Johnson, one of our pastors, would always put it like this. If I've been praying for revival for years, and it breaks out in the other guy's church across town, and I'm in any way disappointed, it shows what I've really been praying for. You know, that's right. That's exactly right. You know, there's, there's a famine on spiritually. We want people to eat. Doesn't have to be at our restaurant. We're not perfect chefs. God knows that. Our people know that. You want people to eat. You want people to be fed. In my pastoral prayer, I usually pray for other churches by name. And I try to pray for churches even of other denominations just to make it clear that we want the gospel to prosper. That's part of how we train ministers up as we should, giving people a heart for more than just our own congregation. Not in any way to diminish the Lord's work in our congregation. I wanna see that prosper. But I think it will prosper most healthily when we're rejoicing just as much in the prosperity of a sister church across town. Number 10, a combination of trust and strategy. Too often I think we see those things opposed to each other. I think the Puritans are examples of how you can have a great trust in God and at the same time work very hard. So Richard Sibbs, my guy, was uh, in legal trouble because he got together with a few other preachers like William Googe, um, a few rich businessmen, and a few lawyers. And they called, they, I'll translate it into modern, it, they came up with like a, uh, a board for jobs. A, uh, it was called the Fiat Fees for Appropriations. It was a, a group of men who would buy the right to name ministers or afternoon lecturers in strategic towns around England. And then they would put in godly men pastoring those churches and so that they could see all of England filled up with these godly preachers. And the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, William Laud, I would like someone to hiss when I say his name. The Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, William Laud, thank you. <laughs> he, on more than one occasion, is recorded as fulminating in anger you know, these men will have their sibs and their googe to say who can be a preacher. You know, he hated it. So he finally got them busted on a technicality that they didn't have a royal charter and he got the whole thing dissolved. But for years, these guys who were trusting in God also worked very hard and strategized with money and careful thinking to try to get the gospel to penetrate England. So that combination of strategy and trust. Let me give you, uh, I think we got time for another one. Okay, uh, number 11, the centrality of the afterlife. Um, you know when the great plague happened in London and all the, uh, all the, I would say, hirelings, pastors were sort of flooded out so they wouldn't catch the plague? All the kind of Puritan pastors were flooding in to try to help. You do that because you know that you have a life with God guaranteed forever. And this kind of unembarrassed affection toward God and desire for the afterlife showed itself in their hymns. So something I've tried to cultivate in the years of my pastorate at CHBC is hymns that talk about the afterlife. But let's not be ashamed of that at all. Don't be put off by Marxist scare tactics that tell us if we talk about the afterlife, we're diminishing the worthwhileness and the value of, of this life. Not true at all. And part of the ways, in fact, we will rightly balance this life and rightly give ourselves in this life is by teaching our people to value the life to come. Do you notice how most of the characters in Pilgrim's Progress are named after how they're oriented toward heaven? If, if you follow the characters along in Pilgrim's Progress, the whole image is one of going to heaven. Their, their whole identity, Christian's whole identity, is that he is a pilgrim on his way to be with his master. So much more I could say about that. I think the Puritans are faithfully reflecting the emphasis we see in the New Testament. I think of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, when he's talking about the resurrection. And he says in verse 19, if in Christ we have hope 
in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. I wonder if your people think that. I wonder if you've taught them to value that promise of being eternally present with the Lord and for that to be part of the calculus of every decision they make. Let me share with you a 12th thing, just briefly. And I've learned this from the Puritans, I say, and here I'm being a little tricky, really by default. And that is the importance of believing congregations being the church. Uh, Jonathan Edwards found this out the hard way uh, when some, I would say, mistakes he made in the way he announced a certain investigation in public sounded like accusations and many of the unregenerate in the church uh, got rid of him. I think that what, even someone who I love like Richard Sibbs, something he had to deal with a century earlier in the Church of England, is a church full of unregenerate people. And I think the church in the New Testament is meant to be a mutually covenanted group of those who give good evidence of being born again. Because as a people, as a whole, we're to reflect the character of God. And one of the things that uh, the Puritans, I think, struggled with in their various settings was exactly how to do this. And I think they were helped by congregational polity when John Cotton and John Owen and Thomas Goodwin figured that out in the New Testament correctly, I think. And then what the, the final step they kind of needed there was believer baptism only baptizing believers. But that's a more controversial point, and I leave that for you. But that's something that I feel, even if by negation, I learned from the Puritans. Friends, there's so many more things I could say. The Puritans have been wonderful friends for me uh, on this long journey the Lord has called me to. And I think they could be wonderful friends for you as well. Let me close by sharing with you this one prayer. If you have Valley Visions on page 186, I'm just gonna lead us in praying it very slowly, not as slowly as I would in private, but more slowly than maybe many people are used to praying. Let's pray together. This one's called just a minister's prayer. And it's said in single, uh, first person singular, and I would encourage you whenever you pray in public, pray first person plural, we and us, because you're not just having your quiet time out loud. You are in the unusual position of everybody else closing their mouths and listening to you. You are speaking to God for everyone. So cultivate using us and we when you open your mouth and pray out loud. But I'm gonna pray mine now because I'm just reading this. Oh my Lord, let not my ministry be approved only by men or merely win the esteem and affections of people, but do the work of grace in their hearts. Call in thy elect. Seal and edify the regenerate ones and command eternal blessings on their souls. Save me from self-opinion and self-seeking. Water the hearts of those who hear thy word that seed sown in weakness may be raised in power. Cause me and those that hear me to behold thee here in the light of special faith and hereafter in the blaze of endless glory. Make my every sermon a means of grace to myself. And help me to experience the power of thy dying love. For thy blood is balm. Thy presence, bliss. Thy smile, heaven. Thy cross, the place where truth and mercy meet. Look upon the doubts and discouragements of my ministry and keep me from self-importance. I beg pardon for my many sins, omissions, infirmities, as a man, 
as a minister. Command thy blessing on my weak, unworthy labors and on the message of salvation given. Stay with thy people and may thy presence be their portion and mine. When I preach to others, let not my words be merely elegant and masterly, my reasoning polished and refined, my performance powerless and tasteless. But may I exalt thee and humble sinners. O Lord of power and grace, all are in thy hands, all events at thy disposal. Set the seal of thy almighty will upon my ministry. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bethlehem College and Seminary is still accepting applications for the coming academic year. For more information, visit bcsmn.edu.